second thing is uh, with our Thomas More thing, there is the utopia, which of course I told you that the fact that school never talks about Thomas More, I never saw anything, but he of course initiated this whole idea to write utopias, and the utopia presents what ought to be in a society, and so there are utopian elements in the Frankfurt School, um, so there is a, a certain connection. Now, what I did, I wrote to the priest there in order to mobilize his, um, you know, his group a little bit, because he told him it was a thinking type of a, of a lecture, you know, where people would learn to think, and Catholics don't want to think. I mean, that was a big mistake to do that, I mean, so he was shying, pushing them away by yeah, saying this, and I hope he will create a new text there, okay. Okay, then, um, Saturday round table, you know that you are always invited, right? And, um, yes. all of you, and uh, so that is a nice invention which I, which we made uh, in order to continue that. Uh, we said something about the test on the 11th of, uh, February, that would be a week from the day, I think, from the 11th to the 18th. Two options, as we said. I will make up a few questions. You can answer them. Or you can write on the man whom you have chosen, uh, the critical theorist whom you have chosen, and give a summary where you are standing. That's right. Um, okay. Um, have we all chosen our man now? Yes. Mm. Okay, let's see where we are and how far we have moved, or if there are some difficulties. You went to the round, uh, to the, what is it, old house, and uh, water, and you said there were some problems which came up, you know, what is theory, and oh, yeah. other things. Uh, can we they just start out with these problems which came up? We had uh, lots of discussion uh, between me and Liz, because yeah, she no. doesn't stand on strong footing with Freud, yeah. and she is getting more comfortable with Marx, right? Okay. And so she was looking for someone uh, that you could suggest, or anyone could suggest, that would help her bridge these gaps. Right. The other thing was the, the old criticism that I had, why don't you have a Wikipedia entry, right? Mm. A and you have made no attempt to write one, and no one else has. Wikipedia, if you have forgotten, is that uh, encyclopedia that is written by the world. Anyone yeah. can change it. It's the free encyclopedia. It's the free encyclopedia in more ways than one. Yeah. Is that good to see you for idiots or what? No. no. Like, Judaism for idiots. No, no, no. It's not that bad. They all write books like this. Though. If we put an entry on there, yeah. we could go to Wikipedia and lock it down so it doesn't change haphazardly. So what is the purpose then to to make it simple or what? Uh, to, to open your, your knowledge to the world. Yeah. To make it more accessible. But, I mean, we have a website which everybody can take, right? Hey, keep arguing. I'm going to chime in any time you want. We had this two years ago. Yeah. I mean, but this opens it, this this opens to a larger audience. Oh yeah. yeah. You're uh, we can you're allowed to link to different things. Uh -huh. So you can link your ideas with the critical school and Horkheimer and and, yeah. and Adorno and the yeah. ideas and where you meld these two and you link so people can connect what you're so saying. Can we take some of our website and put it in there? Yeah. We could. Yes, we could. What we need is one or two paragraphs on your biography, mm -hmm. one or two paragraphs of uh, concise of the critical theory of religion. Well, that's all on the website, already. Yeah, I know, but that's... Well, just take a few sentences and put them in there. That's the problem. We came up to this problem before. Which couple of sentences? Yeah. It, needs to be matter, quite, it needs to be quite precise. Yeah. Yes. Are Very you, clear. Is that a real serious thing, or is that just a, yes, a lot of people do use it, and really? often the number one entry on an internet search yeah. is that site. So if somebody was putting in critical theory and or religion, basically they would get a Wikipedia mm -hmm. entry. But you'd have to oversee... But somebody told me that you cannot quote from this thing, because it is not really academic. Yes. It does. Yeah. Schools look down upon it. Yeah, really, um, they do. But uh, yeah. it's, it's becoming more accessible, at least from my That's what I heard. Like about Wikipedia's it. enforcing more yeah. need for. Yeah. Well, I, I like to quote from it, and somebody said, "You know, we cannot quote this." But the problem with quoting from Wikipedia 
it is that first of all the student who believes in plagiarism goes in there cuts and pastes paragraphs from Wikipedia into their paper, mm -hmm. right? And so the paper reads first person, third person, second person, first person, and it's very obvious that you can see. Mm -hmm. And so to defend against this, some of the professors and some of the departments and some universities have outlawed it outright, mm -hmm. so it makes them harder, harder to plagiarize. Yeah. What I, tell, what I tell my students with Wikipedia is that it's a good place, if you know nothing about the subject matter, to start there and just read through that real quick. Mm -hmm. That at least gives them an orientation. And then on the bottom of the Wikipedia pages is where it's most useful, because it gives you all the sources to refer to, and that's where all the, the books are. You put all the links and your books and whatnot, mm -hmm. but it has to be clear and concise. Yeah. Right, it, it, and it's very positivistic oriented. Uh, if anybody wants to give that, it's okay with me. Uh, you know, put, yeah, put well. a few sentences in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can just take it out of what uh, what we have on our website there. Well, uh, and then put some underneath so that people can link it. If right? you want to link it, so yeah, they can look at the website. Can we call it Rudipedia? <laughs> 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 Okay, well, it's, it's okay with me. I mean, as long as we don't do status, oh, yes. it will not bring the uh, theory down. The other issue at the Roadhouse was the dis making the distinction between defining the critical theory and applying it. The difference between mm -hmm. is theoretical and philosophical structure mm -hmm. and its methodological. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, let's, let's look at one after the other. The first thing was, you know, you said, what is theory or whatever? Well, it's not a question of what is theory. She has an idea. We all have this idea of what theory is, right? Yeah. And it goes from, you know, the positivistic range to the, you know, dialectical theory. Yeah. Right? And I mean, but what sociology? I mean, the sociology department. So what is the relationship between theory and sociology? So if you take Parsons, you know, as, a, as an analogy, mm -hmm. so Parsons developed a big theory in which sociology, anthropology, psychoanalysis, and so on are all united. So, um, you know, a theory, critical theory, is more than just sociology. That may be one thing. If somebody studies in sociology, you know, thinks, well, that is just the sociology. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, these people now, they're Goldstein or whatever, yeah. they have a I always looked at the critical theory of the Frankfurt School not as a middle range, but as a grand theory because right. the critical theory something, you know? contains so many middle range theories. Right. But if you see, you know, I mean, Bloch was a Schellingian, a Schelling guy, and Habermas is a Schelling guy. So Schelling is a real big narrative, you know, that's a real theory. So it's Hegel, so it's Fichte, so it's Kant. Now, is the critical theory, does it really come up, you know, in breadth and intensity to those? Do they have the ambition, you know, to do something? Uh, even when they call Frankfurt School, you know, is it a real school, like a platonic school, like a Weber school, and so on and so on. So, well, it's open to discussion, you know. I, I think it was when they, when they wrote the article, Traditional and Critical Theory, they, you know, oppose the traditional theory, positivistic and so on, with the critical one. And there is the ambition at least to be a theory like Parsons, you know, without doubt. So with Parsons you have a positivistic one and then the opposite dialectical one. I think they wanted to be on the level of Marx, you know, on the level of Freud maybe. But the rest you see, I mean, Hegel is much greater than Marx, and Marx knew that. And Marx is much greater than Freud, you know, and Freud I think knew that too. So there are great differences between thinkers and also their theories. Okay. But one um, can leave it open, you know. I mean, it was Merton who uh, started out with that middle range type of a thing, you know. Function, dysfunction. Uh, I mean, yeah. is it really a play, a, like Plato or NASA? Do they want to be that, you know? I mean, if you look what Habermas did, bypassing Hegel's uh, system and going back to the human potential of language and memory or human potential of uh, struggle for recognition, and Marx also concentrates on the human potential of work and tool, and so does Freud on sexuality. And so it is, while Hegel has all five human potentials and develops out of this, that system, you know, they concentrate more on one of, of them or two of them. You know, even uh, the, the guy, the students of, of Habermas, they concentrate then more on the struggle for recognition. 
but it is, it's, they don't sum it all up, you know, it's, maybe it's too ambitious to do that. So it has something to do with the sciences have evolved so much, you know. So is it like Thomas Kuhn, as science is yeah. developing and more and more hypotheses are, yeah. are, are, are accumulating and then it, we're getting more and more yeah. specific rather than right. you know, five potentialities and the geist is developing. Hi, hello. I mean, Kuhn's uh, great thing was the paradigm theory, you know. Mm -hmm. That means that the sciences go to a paradigmatic evolution and that. Um, you know, if that constitutes a mid-range theory, I don't think he has, I mean, the very creative and productive element is that, um, you know, how that really goes. How, how do we go from uh, Galileo, or, you know, to, um, to Einstein, or to Heisenberg, and, and so on, what is really happening? And so, uh, he calls the paradigm, you know, a combination of ideas and, and uh, values, and so on, and so on and all that changes that, and Hans Küng has taken that over and has applied it to a religion, to the evolution of religion, so that you have, you know, one religion after the other, and each religion has uh, five or six paradigms. So Christianity, original Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Roman Catholic, Protestant Christianity, Enlightenment Christianity, and now Ecumenical, and, and every time, you know, and Hans Küng says it comes from Kuhn, so makes um, things that cannot be done, you know, because in the sciences, we know how that paradigm changes because Galileo, you know, sharpens the lenses and develops mathematical formulas and therefore made this step forward. And then you know exactly, you know, why we cannot redo Galileo anymore, you know, or, or Newton or something like that, why, why this is really over. But can you do the same thing in religion or art, you know, or philosophy? I mean, how do you know that religion is over? Uh, why, why can we not pray to Apollo any longer, you know? Or why can Protestants not pray to the Blessed Mother any longer? I mean, what is it now? And, and there it is the question of uh, plausibility, of plausibility and acceptability. At a certain point, you know, a religion or a religious paradigm, like for Protestants, Catholicism or so, is not really um, uh, acceptable anymore. So you could have observed that today, where Protestant students, you know, in a, in a, um, in a what, what is it, Anglican, you know, Anglican Benedictine monastery, which looks very Catholic, you know, and there are elements of alienation, estrangement, you know, why are these men not married, and why did they live in celibacy, and, and so on and so on, and, you know, so they would cease, you know, that there is a barrier between the two, a barrier of implausibility. It's not plausible anymore why these men are doing this. Or, and it is then not acceptable, you know. But uh, so then, when a religion is dead, it is dead, you know. Um, so for the Gautama, he could not accept this the Odyssey delusion of the, the, of the Hindus anymore. That you had to go through thousands of years of reincarnation in order to purify yourself, in order to join Brahm, and therefore, you know, invented a fantastic type of theory. By the way, there is a theory. First of all, what is the cause of all suffering? And how can all suffering be overcome? So it's a fantastic time. So the, in the East there was never any differentiation between religious and philosophical ideas. They are not yet differentiated. The differentiation takes place in Greece. And then with us, after Hegel, the differentiation of philosophy of, uh, and science. And you see, too, our students are completely estranged from philosophy. They're estranged from theology. It's a completely positivistic university. And, you know, we could not put suddenly a cross up again, you know, in the classroom or whatever. It's, it's just not doable. It's not doable. And so there are really, when you go to another paradigm, uh, everything changes. I mean, you know, if you go from Galileo, from Ptolemaeus to Galileo, for instance. Ptolemaeus, everything is flat, you know, heaven up there, hell down there. That's how the Quran was written. That's how the New Testament is written. That's how the Torah is written and the Bhagavad Gita, you know, and the Persian writing. And then suddenly, you know, he sharpens the lenses and, and looks in a different way. And um, there is still the earth, there is still the sun, but they are all rearranged in a different way now. And then we have to have that with, with Einstein too, you know, so he has the gravity, the law of gravity now, but that, these, that the, the time bends, you know, that the time and space are bent. Uh, when, when, the, uh, you know, when the moon went to the sun, they had to catch that moment, and they took pictures, and they saw that the position had, had changed of, of the stars around it, and so on. 
That's how the Haraturgi theory came about. And then, you know, but you had, they had to prove that. You see, they, he had it in formulas. He knew it all. But then they went to one place where they looked at the darkening of the sun, and then they came to late, and another, they had to go to Australia, and they had to go to Africa, and then when they were, I think in Africa, the, the pictures didn't turn out well, and so just one picture went out. But, well, I mean, what kind of, a, of a, you know, what a, a thing what they had to do to travel and to wait, and, you know, in order to get that moment, because you have that evidence, and you saw that the planets had changed their position. So you could see that only when the sun was dark, you had to do it in daytime, and, and when it was dark, then you suddenly could see that relativity, and then it was proven. So from that time on, there is no Newton anymore. It's all finished. That was why it became so unbelievably famous, you know. So, um, uh, so th- this is the paradigm theory. Now, if it fits, you know, religion and art and so on, I think Quinn did quite well, you know, in, uh, in looking at the different Jewish paradigms, you know, the tribal paradigm, the empire paradigm, and so on. And it has all kinds of consequences, you know, for instance, when Muslims go back into an older paradigm, or the Jews, you know, you have usually, or the Germans, you know, you have a catastrophe when you uh, see, so because there are some Jews who have the empire paradigm. That means they are still, they think they are the David and Solomon. But it's all over, you know. But if you think it's not over and you try it, and you suddenly have borders which go from the Nile to the Euphrates, you know, you get in trouble with everybody. You, know. you have one more after the other, and it will not work. I was once in Yonina, I taught, you know, at the border of Albania in, in Greece, and the professors asked me if the Germans had read Hegel, for instance, their own Hegel, you know, would they have done what Hitler did? No, they wouldn't, because it's too late, you know. It was all over. The German Empire was finished, you know, and you cannot go back to an older paradigm. The Third Reich, you know, the Third Empire was following the second one of Bismarck, you know, and the first one, and so on. But you couldn't have, they talked about the third one already in the Middle Ages, so it was all over, it couldn't be done anymore. So therefore, it is, it is interesting, you know, it has practical applications. And as far as Kuhn is concerned, I, I think he, he did a good job, you know. So, Metz's objections have not been listened to. But the left-wingers, if they think, you know, that, that Kuhn, you know, is a small, uh, it's, it's, he's not a heavyweight guy, he's a, he's a lightweight guy of a boxer. So <laughs> they don't have much respect for him, which is, which is interesting, you know, for left-wing people. When they want to have a theology, they want to have a real heavyweight one. And uh, Kuhn is not delivering that. But, uh, Let's look at key concepts that the Frankfurt School uses from Marx and from Freud. Okay, that was your second point then, yes, about Freud. We are talking about you mm-hmm. and uh, some uh, questions you had when you went to the, the old house. Uh, so oh, one like thing, I, I don't know who asked the question, so it doesn't matter, but we just talked about theory and we brought in the idea of the Parsonian theory, and the theory is more than one discipline. A theory unites different disciplines under a certain principle. And uh, so uh, that is one thing we want to clarify. Now another one, you said something about Freud. Walter, did yeah, we yeah. had questions about people's strengths and weaknesses in Freud. So yeah. we want to go through the key concepts right, that the Frankfurt School relies okay. upon from right. Freud. Very good. So first of all, how does he, did they get to Freud? You know, he was not there all the time. No. So uh, Horkheimer started with Schopenhauer first. Mm-hmm. And throughout his life, up to the end, Schopenhauer was always there. So in the end, we have still essays, actuality of, of Schopenhauer and so on. So that remains. So after Schopenhauer, they became then familiar with, uh, with Marx. And they read Marx the first time, but that was only after the First World War, then before there was no Marx. And then uh, with through Marx, they came also to Hegel then. And then late, they came to, to Freud. And uh, the reason for that was that Horkheimer himself had psychological problems. So he went Landauer, to Landauer, to Karl Landauer, was says, Aye, there we have another of our students. Karl Landauer, please write that down. He died in Belsenbergen. He starved to death in Belsenbergen. So he was a Freudian. He had studied under Freud, Karl Landauer. And he had a praxis, a psychoanalytic praxis in Frankfurt. 
and then the Nazis made trouble because he was Jewish. And the whole attitude of fascism towards psychoanalysis would be an interesting theme. They were psychoanalysts and the Nazis. Uh, and they practiced, but he went to Holland, so he was in Amsterdam where we went there, and uh, then stayed there until they picked him up with his family and so on, and put him to Belsenberg, and that was called, and uh, so he died a horrible, horrible death there. But Horkheimer had a psychological problem. There, there is a chair there, David, that you can take him and sit with us here. Thank you. So uh, the problem, the psychological problem of, uh, that's interesting for all of us, a programmer was that he could not lecture without notes. He had to read the texts all the time. And so he wanted to free himself and give that self-confidence, you know, to speak freely before students. And so he went into psychoanalysis. It lasted a few months, and then Landauer said that he, that Hockheimer was much too happy a guy well, he had Maiden who made him happy, so and then therefore, uh, you know, he didn't really need it. But then they became friends, and I just looked through their letters, which they wrote in 33, 34, 35. Harkheimer was here, he was in Amsterdam, and they exchanged and they became friends with each other. Very nice, uh, nice letters. Now, Landauer concentrated on emotions in people, and that was his specialty. And here I have a few of his books, which are uh, unfortunately on in German. So, now that is one contact with Freud. What's the contact? We want to talk about the concepts. Well, we have to see how they are connected. So, whatever got into the critical theory from Freud, you know, how did it get to them? And one connection was Karl Landauer. The other connection was from. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, where later on this, this uh, problem arose between Fromm and, and the school there. So, now, Fromm uh, um, and Landauer, where both, Landauer was the head of the sociological department, uh, the psychoanalytical department in the Frankfurt School, in the basement they were. A famous fellow later on, who was also there, is Mitchellich, Mitchellich and his wife. They have become famous because after the war they concentrated on the Germans' inability to mourn. Mm -hmm. That means they couldn't mourn and they couldn't repent uh, of what they had done. Uh, they just went into the miracle, economic miracle, and got completely distracted. They paid uh, billions of marks, uh, of marks to, to Israel, but it didn't really go into them. You know, they never thought that they really did something wrong. It was rather to, uh, that they wanted to look good to the victors, and they wanted to make a good impression on the victors, and one good, you know, how you do that is to pay a lot of money for Israel. But that, that really went into them, you know, we killed six million Jews. And so, by the way, even now you have that. Last week the Pope uh, resolved or uh, lifted the excommunication of three right-wing Catholic bishops in Switzerland who have been excommunicated and one of them right away went on television and denied that six million Jews had really been killed and then uh, when he saw what problems he had uh, produced he wrote an apology and uh, said I'm so sorry that I produced all these problems to the Holy Father who just you know lifted the excommunication <laughs> and uh, but he did not re uh, rescind he did not rescind what he had said about the six million Jews, that they, uh, they had not died, the six million Jews, and so on. So, and he's Angela a Holocaust Merkel denier. Huh? Some, uh, nasty huh? letter. Angela Merkel. She sent a letter to the Pope, to the Pope now, and asked the Pope to make a clear statement that the six million Jews had really been, been killed, and so on. So, I mean, it reaches right into our presence, so, the, the, you know, the anti-Semitism problem is far from being, from being resolved in, in any way, so... Okay, by the way, I have one question. How could I find out in my three volumes if I had written something already or not? Because, you know, I, I have something on anti-Semitism, but I would like to know if already in the first volume or the second volume I said something about this. We can search. Is there any way? Yes. How can you search for this? We'll do a keyword search on the phrases that you're looking for, the humans, and we will search through the 600 pages for the first 600? I don't 2000. know. 2,000? For the first volume. Oh, yeah. 
So that's in the second volume. You think it's in the first it. volume or the second? Yeah, either the first volume. Okay, so we'll yeah. search both. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's the side thought. If I, that's yeah, fine. It would be good. <laughs> yeah, so on the, on the other side, there's one good look, right? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so now Landauer was the head of this department. But Landauer and Fromm and another psychoanalyst who is not so famous, and I forget his name, they were the people who did that project with the 8,000 uh, workers about the authoritarian and the, and the revolutionary personality. And there, the questionnaire which they developed had already strong psychoanalytic elements. Right. That means to ask questions, you know, whom do you prefer, Napoleon, you know, or the Gautama, or whatever, in order to, um, so that people would also reveal their unconscious motivations. Right. So slowly they accepted from Freud the idea of the unconscious, for instance. The idea of self-reflection, which was very important for them, you know, that, uh, and the idea of guilt, and the idea of guilt feelings, which are connected with the killer instinct, with the aggressive element, with the sadistic element. There is, uh, there is a whole essay on Desade in the uh, Dialectics of Enlightenment. So, so when people are aggressive and, and that First World War, yeah, we said, you know, they have something to do with First World War, with fascism, and with Second World War. And so if you kill 10 million people, you kill, and then you kill 60 million people, and you kill 27 million communists, and you kill 6 million Jews, and so on. They always forget these 27 million yeah, communists, you know, should count it as well. So, uh, but this is a lot of killing, you know. So that's what then John the 23rd calls the culture of death. And then, you know, the next Pope added to that, we want to have a culture of love. I don't know, I told you that funny story. I went to Zagreb, you know, very often. And in Zagreb there was a group of priests who worked together with Tito. And they had a journal and they had a center there. So I had lunch with them one day. And one of the priests had a brain operation. And he fell asleep all the time. So while we were eating, he just dozed away. And, and so... But whenever he woke up, he said, and what we need is a culture of love. And then we <laughs> <laughs> So the whole discourse went on like this. No matter where we were in that discourse, as soon as he came up, he said, what we really need is a culture of love. And then he snored even while, while we were sitting and eating our hamburger. You would never, never forget this. Uh, right? They're all dead in the meantime, poor guys. <laughs> okay, so this is how, and, and Freud, you know, remains, uh, so, I mean, the authoritarian personality, you know, is a Freudian concept. Yes. In a certain sense, you know, and there is the revolution. But there is already also uh, Marx, you know, so it's the marriage of Marx and uh, Reich, for instance, another one who did not belong to the Frankfurt School, but who also did this, because sociology and psychology, what is the relationship between the two, was important for them, you know, so... Freud had made the impression that uh, uh, sociology was only applied psychology, which is interesting. I mean, every sociologist must commit suicide when he hears this. So, so, and then they learned from Marx that the laws which determine the mechanisms of the psyche, like for instance the sex mechanism instinct, and the other one, the death instinct or the ego instinct, etc. So these rules were somehow objectivated and then appeared as rules of society a la Marx opposite the psyche and independent of the psyche. So when Bush says, you know, I'm a free market guy, but I can't help myself, I have to federalize, you know, against my will or whatever, and this struggle is horrible among the media guys now and so on, you know, then it is clear that the movement of capital follows rules which are not the same as the rules or the laws which govern the psyche of these people. So there is some an objective reality opposite. And so when you're in the psychology department, when you have these people, you know, we construct reality or whatever. This is, of course, a very limited type of, of a concept. Uh, I mean, what, uh, what uh, Galileo did or what Newton did, I mean, they constructed a certain concept of gravity, of the law of gravity, you know. But the, there is something independent from their psyche, which went on for a long time before they existed and after they existed. Uh, and all what they did was, you know, to produce the formulas of something 
which was out there and which rules the whole universe or whatever. So, so this. Uh, um, really, what about this other idea of this Freudian idea of the repressed? Right. A lot of yeah, and that is called repressed together with the authority. You know, that's where the authority comes from. So when you go up in the Catholic Church, you know, then something happens to your sex drive. The sex instinct, and, and there, there are instincts, is already, of course, you know, Freud in theory, because he said, all the others talked about spirituality, I want to talk about that other thing which is in people which is not spirituality, and what that is, is the sex instinct, which, which has certain teleology, and he, it, in, in all species, so to speak, and uh, it aims at the union with the other sex partner and so on, or the death instinct goes outside and wants to annihilate something, you know, out there. And uh, then both of them can turn around. That means the death instinct, instead of killing the enemy, kills oneself. And then you in the army you suddenly have 30 uh, suicide cases a month or something like that. Uh, so, and, and also, then you can... Uh, the sex drive, you know, it can be object bound, but it can also return to oneself, and then it is self love, that means it's narcissism. And this narcissism plays a, a great role, you know, it could almost say that Freud discovered that. And the civil society, which is atomistic and individualistic, is narcissistic to, uh, to, to a large extent, you know. So, um, I mean, if you talk with somebody, you know, say, I, I went to the Alps and so on, I, I went to the Alps four times, you know. That means there is, there is not listening to you now and your experience of the Alps, but right away, you know, it turns to his own self and how many times. And it goes even, you know, when you have, said, well, I have cancer of the liver, or I, I have you know, also from, of the heart and the colon and whatever. You know. Everybody competes with the other, but the reflectivity, just listen to when you have a talk or so, that the other, instead of going out of himself and listening now to your experience, he right away brings his own experience, he reflects back all the time. Also, when you talk about something, then the other nevertheless listens in such a way as, it have, as if it has something to do with him. And so you have to be very careful with all so-called objective statements, because everybody may feel personally uh, touched by that experience, and may mean, you know, that you say something uh, about him. Or the performative side of every speech act. Performative means not the content of the speech act, but what the speech act is doing. And the difficulty of talking in the United States is that whatever you say, and you mean it as objectively as you want to, it also has this performative side that somebody else, you know, so you talk about the class system. And right away somebody thinks, where am I in that class system, you know? And so when you say, um, the plumber or whatever, you know, Joe the plumber or so. It's not then, you, you cannot stick to Joe the plumber. Everybody thinks, am I the Joe the plumber? Uh, am I low middle class? Does he say I'm not low middle class? This produces a very difficult speech situation, you know, this narcissism. So the narcissism plays an important role, <laughs> and um, the authority is internalized into the superego, according to Freud, <coughs> and then represses the instincts. That means that it, uh, it prevents people from killing others, but it also prevents people from um, you know, from loving others as well. You know, so that if somebody you know sees a priest suddenly uh, and uh, has a girlfriend or whatever, he may have an uncomfortable feeling and may take the girlfriend in another room or whatever, because there is this authority. Imago running around there, you know, father image or whatever. And out of this, of course, Freud developed his theory, you know, of religion, <coughs> which, uh, which centers around this whole authority thing, because the sons kill that father because he played this moral authority by imposing on them the incest taboo. They could not sleep with their sisters or whatever. Uh, they could not sleep with their mother, or the, the Electra complex, the girls could not sleep with the father, and, and so on. So, and that is the first core of the morality. But even in that story already, and in the Oedipus story, and so on, the authority plays an important role. So therefore, uh, Arkham wrote a book of author, uh, authoritarian state, for instance, 
they wrote um, a study, uh, Marcuse from and Horkheimer, about authority and family. And, and, but all that has something to do with fascism now. That's why we want to read that thing. And for them it has something to do with anti-Semitism. Because the question is, how does somebody become a fascist? How does somebody become an authoritarian personality? Well, because the father, you know, who says, you must do this, you must do that, or whatever. What are you doing with your sister in the basement, or whatever, you know. This guy forms the, uh, forms the superego, and so produces little authoritarian personalities all the time, who then have a guilt feeling concerning their sexuality, for instance. So, it's not only the guilt, but the guilt feelings, and that guilt feeling can be morbid. It can be sick, so... Freud does not identify now the source of the guilt feeling, namely the killer instinct, but also if that feeling about the guilt is really healthy. So I always say to people, you know, don't feel guilty when you're not guilty, you know, and do feel guilty in God's name when you are guilty, because there is a guilt potential in everybody that he may feel guilty all over the place, and it doesn't help at all. That means toward the more rational society, I'll turn to future number three, this guilt feeling can get very much in the way. It can be very inhibiting for people's actions in this direction. So, uh, so all these things hang together. Authoritarian personality, authority internalized, the authority violence, you know, the father who, uh, who beats up his sons, for instance, and uh, they contain in themselves that guilt feeling because the act of violence of the father is internalized into their superego and whatever now that instinct is doing inside, you know but the first thing what this internalized authority does inside is the repression of this thing it pushes it away from, from its goal you know, he cannot get to the other girls he wants to go to, or if you go to the other girls, he does it with a certain guilt feeling, which is not very healthy, and so on. So, this was the complex of Freud, which interested the Frankfurt School people. In order to see how does the fascist personality come about, uh, Hitler could not be successful if he has not millions of these, of these uh, authoritarian personalities around, and um, what can one do if you really want to fight anti-Semitism and so on. So um, there was, in, in a letter which I don't know about to Horkheimer, he developed a theory of anti-Semitism, and that is not, see, a theory can consist of many little theories. As a matter of fact, Marx consists of little theories. So the uh, crisis theory or the revolutionary theory are different sub-theories of the big theory. So the big theory does not only contain different disciplines like sociology and anthropology, but it contains also certain sub-theories. And so, the, therefore, the, the racist thing there was, of uh, Adorno, was a certain sub-theory. And this sub-theory that can be very daring, you know. Uh, that means you can say, I'm throwing that out now, you know. But uh, if you really have enough evidence, you know, for it. Uh, by the way, for a moment, let me just say that too. The, the interest for instance in porno. Gretel asked um, her former boyfriend, Benjamin, uh, to send her something which Brecht had written about porno. Or if Brecht had written some porno poems, and Benjamin said Brecht never wrote any porno poems. But, of course, he did write poems which one could call porno. But the question is, is it really porno, or is it real art? So, the, I mean, this is all, always, you know, <laughs> the lawyers and so on, they always ask, you know, what's the difference between real art and, uh, and porno and so on. So, but these fellows, you know, what happens when you go through this type of thinking and you begin to neutralize the authority and the superego, you know, because then you set those forces free. And, uh, you know, when you look at the life of Adorno, they, they had Gretel there, you know, but um, then he had all kinds of women who appeared and disappeared continually, you know. One of the last things is where a noble woman in, in Germany with whom for once had no sexual relationship, but she helped him, or wanted to help him, 
to catch a girl whom Adorno had, but she ran away to another conductor of an orchestra and left Adorno behind. So Adorno was in very bad shape because she left him. So this noble woman with whom he had a lot of so-called platonic relationship helped him in order to get to that girl again and get her away from this con conductor. Whatever. The same thing was with Pollock to some extent where they you know, I had the same woman, one was mad with her, and the other one, uh, and so on. So, it is, um, one, one has to think, you know, if you release that authoritarian thing, what happens to the instinctual apparatus? What happens to these mechanisms, you know? And Adorno would say, I couldn't help myself. I cannot help myself, you know. Or Tillich, you know, he wrote, uh, uh, for every book he wrote, he had another woman. And Connie Lowe, uh, you know, I had uh, great problems with that Puritan little Connie Lowe, you know. And, and uh, he went to, to his wife, you know, in, in Chicago and said, you know, he has another one. I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> and Connie wanted to leave him, you know. And she said, you, uh, Paulus, you know, Paulus needs those things. You have to understand it. And she wrote a book about all the women then. And uh, uh, one case was a very dangerous one. He uh, had a love affair with, uh, with a Jewish woman she died from cancer, and then he wanted to go to the funeral, and there were all these psychoanalysts and so on were there, and when he entered the room, it was icy cold, you know. They didn't let him give him speech, nothing, you know. He had to just leave the, the room and so on. So, and it was like a demon, you know, they told they, they, that, also tell it, he could not, he was sad about it, uh, you know, but he, he went... He made a woman pregnant when he was an army chaplain in the German army in France. And when he came home, his wife had uh, also become pregnant with somebody else. So then he got a divorce and then he married. And in the night when he married, he didn't go into the apartment of his wife, but he went to an apartment of another woman on the lower level of the same house and spent the night with her. So, so that means it got out of hand. There is something not only psychoanalytically, but also sociologically, because the First World War, you know, oh, in the bourgeoisie, that means it was the first strike, with this optimistic bourgeoisie, you know, we conquer the world, we, you know, Titanic, the symbol Titanic, you know, and then it goes, it gets the iceberg, you know, and it all sinks and so on, that was one of those symbols, you know, because the Titans are the ones who attack the gods, you know, the... Uh, uh, and, and so challenge the gods and then the gods react and sink them all so um, this, this bourgeoisie you know was tremendously changed and uh, Tillich was a bourgeois and it was a bourgeois marriage and, and as they go through that war you know the outside structures collapse and therefore also the inside structures the psychological mechanisms collapse so uh, this uh, um, uh, so we have to you know this, it, is, it is Adorno who have that thing, it is Benjamin who have that, Benjamin's wife had been married already before and was divorced and the wives had all, it was some kind of what we call the open marriage, um, they had, wives had partners, the men had partners, you know, but Benjamin was pretty pitiful, he had a, an actress from Lithuania, a, a communist, she introduced him to Marxism. It is always the question, you know, how got Freud into the whole thing, how got Marx into the whole thing? For Benjamin, it was this Lithuanian woman, uh, an actress under Christ, and he went to Moscow, you know, and, uh, and and she lived with somebody else in Moscow, and she was sick, and then uh, then she came to Berlin, and then she lived with him. It's a, an unbelievable chaos, you know, arises uh, as soon as these, uh, this authoritarian civil society, this authoritarian state, this authoritarian family collapses. And then also the internalization of this authority into the superego collapses. So that then the superego becomes relatively weak and the ego is not able anymore to deal with these very powerful instincts. So that the question of sublimation of these instincts, I mean they all were very intelligent people and certainly sublimated, but it was not, not sufficient. So that the uh, Hartheimer was the only one who lived a real stable uh, stable marriage for, for half a century, but even there, there was this woman from the Illyreuse, from the uh, island of happiness, you know, who, who betrayed them, and he visited her in, in Paris after the war, 
and poor maiden, you know, was eaten up by jealousy and he or choosing letters home and say, you know, if you don't know after 50 years, you know, faithfulness now, that I will not do anything strange or whatever, what can I do? And so, um, so nevertheless, the, you know, when people are set in their Puritan mind or who still have an authority and structure, um, you know, what happens to people who begin to emancipate themselves? And Freud helps to emancipate, you know. But then they fight also for Freud because when they think, you know, and people thought that Freud now was somebody who would say, you know, you can be promiscuous and so on and so on. The very opposite. He was a Puritan, Freud, you know. That means he enforced unbelievably strict laws on all his psychotherapists who, who de dealt with women, you know. I mean, so it is a, completely mis a complete misunderstanding to uh, think that Freud was a, you know, hedonist or whatever. It was the very opposite of all of this. And so, the question is, I asked, you know, when, when uh, Weil, this, this was the family who gave the money, and so the father Weil wanted his son Weil to become a critical theorist, and it didn't work. I mean, he didn't produce anything. And, um, and at the same time, he got involved with one woman after the other, and Horkheimer was, was uh, uh, shocked by this, you know, because he ruined himself with all of this. And Every five minutes he came with somebody else again and said, this is the wife of my dreams and my life and so on. And then, how come, my God, now here it goes again. So, <laughs> but they couldn't do much, you know, he, the father gave all the money, so they had to treat him particularly carefully and so on, but they were horrified by this care. So it, this it, was it, the son of the man who was funding them. Yeah. Oh. The old father, Weil, was a businessman in Argentine who, who shipped food to Germany through the First World War. He broke through the blockade, and so the Germans were very grateful for him, and he became very rich, that process. And then he wanted to have a doctorate, honorary doctorate in Frankfurt, and they said, okay, if you want to have a doctorate, pay for the Institute for Social Research. And he gave a few million, from which they lived then. They took it to New York, you know, invested in Wall Street, it collapsed. Uh, from 29 to 39, there was one Wall Street collapse after the other. But then it recovered again, which it will not do now, but it did at that time still, sometimes. It did not play any role during the Second World War, the Wall Street, you know, it was practically neutralized. <laughs> so one could uh, cut it out, you know, and move on without it. Nevertheless, that is, uh, they, that's what they lived from him, you know, and, uh, and there are all these stories, you know, if they paid enough for Benjamin, the youth movement, you know, became very critical of Horkheimer that he neglected uh, 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 Benjamin, who lived a miserable, miserable life. But, uh, you know, you also have to see when, when that explodes, let's say this explosion of this emancipation, what that means for the children, you know. Uh, Benjamin's son became a communist and then changed again and, and so on and so on. Many of them were neurotic and ill and, and so on and so on. So there is a whole... Uh, sequence, uh, all, all kinds of consequences has that when you deal with this authority structure, be it outside sociologically in the state or in the family, or now what that is doing to the individual, you know. Well, for instance, what, what if you develop a weak superego, you know. Uh, so the, the inner household, and, and let me just explain what the neurosis means concretely. I, I showed the students always the movie there where um, different psychoanalysts you have one one person let's see whatever her name is Gloria or Victoria or whatever um, and so she she was married and uh, then 12 years so she 12 years she had sex and then she is not married now she has to adjust to her non-married status now also sexually and so one day her girl asked her you know if she had somebody else after their father and she said no, so she lied, she did, because she worked as a barmaid and there she let herself take home by truck drivers whom she did not love, but you know, with whom she had sexual relations. And so, uh, so when she was with the truck drivers, she was you know, physically quite happy, but she thought she was a bad mother now. And when she was with the children, then she had the feeling she was a good mother, but what right did the children have to cut her off from her, from her physical uh, relaxation and so on. And then, of course, she had a Protestant superego, 
which says you should not have sex if you don't love anybody. So she didn't love the truck driver, but at the same time she had sex with him anyway, etc. So, so, and so the, the neurosis is now, you know, that you wherever you are, you are unhappy. You are 30 years old, you know, and, uh, and you want to have a full life. But when you are with your children, then to some extent it's okay now, but then the whole mechanism below in the basement doesn't work, you know. And if you are on the other side with the truck driver, that is satisfied, but then you are a bad mother or a bad Methodist or, you know, just a bad person. And, and wherever you are, you cannot be happy, you know. And the, uh, the superego um, uh, consumes in itself aggressive forces, so the ego, super ego bites you, the conscience bites the ego all the time. You know, it's aggressive against the ego, which makes any kind of uh, real living of the pleasure principle uh, impossible. And, and that is a, it's a hellish situation, you know. I mean, many people have to work so hard outside that their inner illnesses, you know, are not even noticed. I mean, a normal worker cannot afford to pay attention to his neurotic uh, uh, happenings, you know, he just doesn't have the leisure for this, you know. But as soon as you are in a more relaxed situation, then, uh, you know, this inner, the inner pain can be quite tantalizing. Like you know. a hierarchy of needs. Well, well, yeah, we put it that way. Okay, so anything else about Freud there? So... The connections, the organization connections, are that the critical theory was never without a psychoanalytical wing in the basement. That means that was before uh, they were driven out, and that was from and Landau and so on. And after they returned again, it was again the connection. And how revolutionary that was, because at that time, no Marxist could teach at the university, German university. No Freudian could teach at the university. So there you have the first people who had a chair uh, in Marxism and had a chair in Freud. So Marx and Freud became academically accepted. And then, of course, you know, there are all the prejudices which we have against Freud. I, when I was here a few years, they fired the last Freudian from our uh, psychology department here. Um, so the positivists have won in a certain sense and have depressed and they are Freudians but if you want to go Freudian analysis you probably have to go to New York and you have to pay horrendous amounts uh, for an hour and, and so on and it's not, uh, the, you know, the low middle class or working class cannot afford this they put them on the pills since the 50s you know, they feed them pills to keep them quiet the whole state of, uh, state hospital up there is just pills, nobody talks so, um, and, uh, and I will take my class again to the psychologist, you know, have psychology collision and uh, after I take him to, to the mosque and so on, I take him to the hospital and uh, I just organized it today so that we can talk with the psychiatrists and psychoanalysts as well and it has something to do with insurance companies and uh, you know, the, so what they do here, they, they give people five hours and you cannot do anything in five hours. Then the hospitals add another five hours, you cannot do anything in ten hours, you know. And then they send people back into the same society which made them sick in the first place. And since we have here psychologists who have no sociology, and sociology have no psychology, the doctors do not even talk about what makes them sick out there. Because, first of all, they don't know anything about the society, and secondly, they don't know anything because they think they cannot do anything about it anyway. And therefore, it's not of their concern. So, therefore, the two disciplines, you know, were always separate, of course, but they were also at the same time united by the larger theory, they were interconnected. But they saw that the division of labor, you know, in the academy had its advantages. So, so you work in psychology, you know, but you work in sociology as if there was no psychology. But in reality, you know, there is no society without individuals, and there are no individuals who have not internalized society, and for whom society is not the environment in which they move. So, uh, analytically, you can take the two sides apart. But practically, and really completely theoretically, they are always interconnected. And so the marriage, you know, Fong did this, Marcuse did this, and Wilhelm Reich did this to bring the two, Marx and, and Freud, together. Because Marx did not have a psychology, and Freud did not really have a sociology. 
for, for Marx, you know, psychology was just an appendix to economics, and uh, for the uh, greed, you know, and uh, for the others, the, um, you know, for Freud, uh, the sociology was just an appendix to psychoanalysis. And so neither of the two took it seriously. I, I think you cover a lot of the critical theory when, when one sees the relationship of the two there. And then the great idealists, you know, which are still behind them, are the great world religions. Uh, um, for instance, uh, when you see the concept of Freud, where Freud says, um, you know, self-criticism, and you have to see, you know, that many things which you project into your enemy out there, you know, or into the race opponent. When you say the blacks are oversexed, the blacks, the blacks have a long penis, and so on and so on, that this, what you see, the shadow, if you would call the shadow, that this shadow is really your own thing. It is really your own inside, you know. So this is a very painful thing, but they were fully aware, you know, that Kant had said things like this, you know, that Jesus had things like, what is it, you know, don't look at the plank or the splitter, you know, don't look at the... Okay, you know, it's the plank and the splinter and something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Has a yeah, so that you see, that you see, you know, first the, the big thing in your own eyes, which blinds you, know, before you look at the other and take the splinter out of his eyes. And so you take the splinter out of the other while you have the plank in your own eye. And so, mm-hmm. so, and, and this Jesus story, you know, you see again in, in, in Freud, you know. And there are many of these Jewish or, or Christian concepts which suddenly reappear in psychoanalysis, you know. But, I mean, basically, the uh, philosophical concepts of right. thinking, right? Yeah, they are translated, you know, or they are inverted, as it is called. You know, they invert um, older religious or metaphysical statements into the language of the critical theory and, and try to, not only to negate, but also to rescue. And that's what we call dialectics, right? That is a determinate negation or a specific negation or concrete negation is this double thing to to say, well, this is mythology, this is metaphysics, we leave that behind, but it is not totally left behind, but there are certain elements which are, which are rescued. So let's look at the contributions of Nietzsche to the okay. 21st school. Because that comes up to, uh, this old house is a very fruitful uh, meeting place. I told you you should come. <laughs> yeah, should, yeah. I'll buy you a bit burger. Okay. <laughs> and at, the end, yeah. at the end of our uh, thing there, to much more event. Okay, now Nietzsche. How does he come in? Well, he isn't there first, you know, except he comes in to Schopenhauer. So Schopenhauer was the first thing. And how does Horkheimer go from the CEO, you know, in, in his father's factories, is transformed into into philosopher because Pollock is closest friend through a little book, you know, of Schopenhauer on his bed and say, damn it, read something, become something. <laughs> so he read this little book of Schopenhauer and was turned on. And that is how the whole thing started. Otherwise he would have been the CEO, you know. And, uh, well, CEO in, a, you know, what the factory it was. They collected rags in the city of Stuttgart and uh, transformed the rags into, into material with which they could to, to make clothing. And, and uh, so it was unbelievably hot, the men and women had to work naked in there, and horrible the chemi- chem- chemicals which ate their, their, their skin and everything. So he knew, you know, what capitalism is. I mean, he found out what capitalism is as a CEO, very, very, and, and it was not possible for him after the war to take all this business over, which he was supposed to do. Okay, so now there is a line, you know, of course, from, from Schopenhauer to Nietzsche. So um, Schopenhauer is the father of metaphysics, uh, of metaphysical pessimism. And uh, behind Schopenhauer there is also, of course, Buddhism and Christianity. So um, that means Schopenhauer inverted Buddhism and Christianity into a philosophy. And uh, then came up with this one book which he wrote, and that is uh, The World as Will and Representation the word as will and representation. So <coughs> representation are images, and these images feed the will to life. Um, that was the discovery of the Gautama, of the Buddha. 
but also in Christianity that you have to crucify your flesh or something like that. Whatever has become of the cross is another thing, but that nevertheless nature or the will to life or the id, you know, for it has to be uh, negated in a certain way. Our humanity, our civilization rests on the negation of these instinctual uh, mechanisms inside. Therefore, civilization is always a burden. Therefore, civilization will always be hated by people. Even if people say, you know, education is so important, deep down they hate it because it civilizes them. And that is not possible without some kind of a repression. Every work which you do, you know, even if it's pleasurable, it needs a certain kind of repression to sit there to work at the assembly line and so on and so on. And therefore, the opposition against civilization. Therefore, uh, so easily, you know, civilization breaks open, uh, uh, you know, the, the Tanamo Bay and the uh, Abu Ghraib and so on are these breakthroughs where the sadism and this killer instinct, you know, is not tamed any longer. Or with the policeman, we put the killer instinct of the policeman against the killer instinct of the criminal. That is the, the delicate balance which the, it has, which the civilization has. But sometimes, you know, that, that, that killer instinct, that policeman, goes on and he beats on, his, uh, on, on the guy who has, lays on the floor over there and has no weapons anymore, and he still goes on beating and beating until sometimes until he's dead. And so, so then the balance goes lost, you see, because we balance nature against nature, and the result is civilization. And at any moment that can go wrong, you know, that is, it cannot work. And so what happened in Germany under certain circumstances, you know, it can happen collectively that the whole civilization breaks down. And I have this in these volumes there where I tell stories about the ss and the living gymnasium and, and the classroom and the Jews down in the basement and, and all this, you know, where you can really physically see how, how a civilization crashes uh, under in a certain pressure situation, war, depression, you know, and whatever people, uh, you know, whatever they have to go through. Okay, so uh, now the, uh, the so they had Schopenhauer and they add Nietzsche and for for, for um, Adorno Nietzsche became so important they learned that he learned maybe more from him than from Hegel and Marx and, and, and so on. So and that is the reason why sometimes uh, the critical theory is mixed up with the uh, deconstructionism. Because deconstructionism comes from Hegel through Nietzsche to Heidegger and, uh, and, and the followers and so on. So uh, the Nietzsche is what the deconstructionists and the critical theorists may have in common. But that does not mean that they are the same now. That would be the wrong logical conclusion. And sometimes I think people mix that up. So um, therefore, uh, because there are different Nietzsches, you know, <coughs> There's a Nietzsche whom the French have uh, received on. There's a Nietzsche which the Nazis had, you know. Uh, and, and there's a Nietzsche which, um, you know, which the Frankfurt School has. So the question is always, what does one make out of Nietzsche? And um, so I don't know all this want of this. So one has this idea, you know, and the Nazis had that, that Nietzsche was, uh, you know, very brutal that he um, turned upside down the scale of values, that the uh, domesticated values, you know, the virtues and so on, which Christianity put on top, that they were turned around downward, and what they had repressed, the biological values, were uh, put on top. So, uh, and, and the Nazis thought of this, you know, Hitler was marching around, you know, with their naked little legs and, and so on. So, where uh, vitality, so the value of vitality was put on top, and uh, the Christian values were put on the bottom. The uh, idea of uh, um, Julian Apostata, you know, who was the guy who in the fourth century uh, turned everything down, tried in the Roman Empire to turn everything down. The Roman Empire had become Christian already, and he had bad experience with his uh, relatives and so on, uh, Christian relatives, so he opened up all the temples again. He demanded that all the temples would have a hospital because the Christians had, you know, made uh, progress through the hospital business and he rebuilt the temple again, tried in Israel, uh, in, in Jewish Palestine or in Palestine at that time. They rebuilt it to some extent, but he went to the Persians and, and to war and came back dead and uh, before they carried him through Jerusalem, the temple broke down again, uh, which was a wonderful <coughs> sign for the Christians, you know, that God had punished him. 
and so his counter revolution did not work and uh, finally the Christianization went on but Hitler in the headquarters you know would say have you read Julian Apostata you know that was the right man that was our man you know the idea that these pagan uh, uh, cultures you know have this emphasis the Spartans and so on, the emphasis of vitality versus holding up the other cheek or some other horrible things and so on so um, and, and so, but therefore one could think, you know, that Nietzsche was a very brutal, you know, and strong guy. In reality, he was sick all the time. He may have had the syphilis, and uh, at least the Catholics always said that really is not a very trustworthy information, I think. So, and whatever, but he was ill most of the time. And um, I went to Seals Marie, you know, where he, where he had his vacations all the time, and where he also wrote and thus spoke Saratustra, which was another attempt, you know, to bring those vital things up. Well, wonderful, wonderful book, you know. So, um, but if we, we could read, you know, his uh, the madman story there, um, where he shows, you know, the end of Christianity and the death of God and, and all these things. Um, but, so, no, let's, in, in a nice little story, it shows you what, what Adorno, for instance, and Marcuse has thought of that, Marcuse and Adorno went to, in the 60s, they went to Seals Marie too, you know, just sitting there on the other side of the Alps, it's toward Italy, a beautiful mountain around, and so they, when they went there, Adorno and Marcuse, they met an old carrier, a guy who had a store downtown, but he also helped people carry their suitcases from the railroad station to, uh, to the hotel. And he carried the suitcase of Nietzsche, so he still knew Nietzsche. And so he told them a story, because Nietzsche had a red umbrella, and uh, the, he needed the red umbrella not for rain, but for the sun. So um, he had a house, I went to the house, which was very close to the church. As a matter of fact, you look through the window, there was really the church. So he must have heard the church ring, ring all the time, the bells ring, and so on. So, uh, uh, but one day the boys uh, put little pebbles into that red umbrella and when Nietzsche turned it around all the pebbles fell on his head and then they walked after him and he climbed up the mountain they put little pebbles uh, on the umbrella and on his head and so um, Adorno said I wonder if he had not second thought about the value of vitality <laughs> so, uh, but you know, the, if that was really all understood right, the re-evaluation re of all values was, was the program of, uh, of, genealogy of, of Nietzsche. Yeah. And so, uh, the, because, you know, at the end of his life, in Basel, he walked on the street and there was a guy who was beating up his horse, because the horse didn't want to go up the hill and so uh, Nietzsche went over and he embraced the horse and he wept, you know, about this horrible thing which was done to the horse and uh, so then he also, a friend was there and he took him right away to the hospital but then he wrote, in the hospital he wrote letters to Burkhardt who was the uh, great medieval historian in, in Basel and, uh, and uh, so he signed it then, you are Jesus the Christ and so the you are not very healthy the, he signed it, the Antichrist, the crucified mm -hmm. one, a whole bunch of different yeah things. right, so he identified, you know, with the with the enemy in a certain sense. He was the son of a pastor, by the way, you know, so he came from a very very Christian family and never had his doctorate, by the way. And um, his field was really, uh, you know, uh, old philology, as that was called, so it was Greek and Roman, and particularly Greek, and he was a master in this, you know, in terms of uh, uh, understanding the Greeks and the, the tra tragedians and, and so on. So, um, so now the question is, you know, what is it? Uh, there is uh, Nietzsche, first of all, you know, had a certain criticism uh, against uh, against Schopenhauer. He thought that Schopenhauer was not pessimistic enough, and um, also uh, um, then uh, Hockheim and Adorno thought that Nietzsche and Schopenhauer both were not pessimistic enough. What does that mean? A total pessimism would mean that there is no chance of redemption for us. So the concept of redemption is a Jewish concept in the West at least, and it meant, you know, that the slaves were redeemed from Pharaoh and 
and uh, were liberated. So redemption has a real material type of thing. It's not something supernatural hanging in the air, something vague or whatever. I don't know exactly, you know, what people say when they say redemption. That they say redemption of their sins, but then they don't mention the sins really, murder and so on and so on. So it is all very vague. But originally, in the Torah, it always means something real and physical. It means to be redeemed, you know, from slavery, for instance, you know. And Moses uh, kills the supervisor, you know, that is the first act of redemption. And then later on, you know, later all the people in Egypt, the firstborn die, a very, very cruel and horrible thing, you know. So redemption is a very concrete and powerful thing. So now for Schopenhauer, there was still redemption. Uh, redemption for what and for what? Well, redemption from the source of all suffering. That means redemption from the will to life. That means redemption from the id. Redemption of the ego from the id. Or for its program, where it is, ego should be. And C.G. Jung's turning this upside down. We, we looked at the women today, in, uh, in where the monks are, there are four women union psychoanalysts. So, but uh, Jung, you know, turns that around again. Where ego is, it should be. That was the end of, of Jung. But Freud's enlightenment program was where it is, the ego should be. So, um, uh, but the question is now, you know, how does this redemption take place? And the last books which Hitler and Goebbels discussed were Schopenhauer over the phone, you know, the phone call. And um, so Hitler carried Schopenhauer in his back to the whole First World War, three volumes, you know. And when he got the Iron Cross first class or so, it was quite a courageous guy, you know. And at the same time, when there was a lull in the battle, he went to Schopenhauer. So, I mean, the American picture, and image of Hitler, you know, is so off the target, you know, that one could not go up further, you know. And it would be now, after 50 or 60 years, I mean, it would be time now that they would get a little bit more mature type of a view of this guy, you know. So, nevertheless, the, uh, the interesting thing would, would be, for me, is which volumes they read, because there are three volumes, which are simply, in a Kantian way, he developed Kant further, so... In a Kantian way, he analyzes the will to life, as the Gautama had done. Um, but then, uh, the thir- fourth volume is about redemption. How, through art, you can redeem yourself from the will to life. Now, when you are in the porno business, the porno business is in the service of life. The, the, the art does not turn you on, really. Porno does turn you on, and then they masturbate afterwards. But the art does not do it. If you look at the, you know, any, any kind of Rembrandt or whatever, even the most beautiful women which they paint, it will never turn you on. It is not in the service of the will to life. That is, you know, when they discuss the legal questions, what is uh, pornography and so on, you know, is, does Shakespeare have pornography, you know, does, um, does uh, uh, Brecht have pornography and so on. Um, I think a good dividing line would be, you know, uh, what turns you on or what sublimates. So, uh, in so far as religion is, as art is porno, uh, it would of course not redeem. It would just, uh, you know, make the whole chain stronger. But uh, in so far as it's real art, it then sublimates and helps the ego to liberate itself from the it. And... Uh, so the, the same thing is then for religion, you know, so two religions, Christianity, and where for him ways by which man redeemed himself from the will to life. But what for? That's another thing, because he was an atheist. That means there where Yahweh was, and Elohim, and so on, there was now nothingness. But even that nothingness was still a violation, you know, of the second commandment, not to make images of the Absolute, because it was just another image of the Absolute, so the Franklin School would say. So, nevertheless, this is the, the all, all philosophy, you know, is another way to redeem. And therefore, Nietzsche would have liked to give even that up, you know, and say it does not even art or whatever uh, really uh, uh, liberates us, you know, from that will to life. So, mm-hmm. if there is no redemption anymore, that would be the peak of pessimism. And Nietzsche. there were tendencies in that, you know, in Nietzsche, and I think also in, in Adorno and so on. 
to the leave. Dionysian art, though, for Nietzsche, hmm? in a sense, the Dionysian art was right. the music that redemption. Or the Apollo, uh, yeah, Apollinian, or the, uh, yeah. And, and the, the great tragedies, of course, too, you know. But wherever, you could say, wherever there is still a chance of redemption, it is not absolute pessimism. You know. So, and that's what the discussion is. I mean, even, um, you know, from things that they were Schopenhauerians or Nietzscheans and so on, therefore they were not happy or whatever. They all had happy hours, you know. I mean, they made jokes. Adorno could make beautiful jokes. And sometimes he was from Frankfurt, and in Frankfurt you have high German, and then you have the Frankfurt dialect, which is a horrifying type of dialect. My mother and my grandmother <laughs> both spoke it. And so somewhere in the middle of the lecture, Adorno would go from this highly developed German, you know, and fall down into the depth of this jargon of the local type of a, of a speech act. And so... It was just horrifying, but it was also unbelievably ridiculous, you know, and... and uh, so what does that sound like for, yeah. for somebody who's a native German speaker? Well, I, I could still do Sounds it. Sounds like a Turk, huh? Hmm? Yeah, I, I still, I mean, if I talk with my relatives in Frankfurt, it comes almost automatically, but it is very, very strange, you know. And so, it's a Hessian type of a, of a, of a dialect. And uh, I, I, very often, I, I, when I come to Frankfurt, I said, you know, where the hell are the natives, you know? They are all gone. They, I mean, one seldom still hears it, you know. On one side of the mind, the other side of the mind, there was even a difference between the two. But, but then, when you, when you talk it, you know, then people are really become happy. I mean, you become one family, you know? It was in the airport in Frankfurt. I said, were you with me or was Katya with me? Uh, I talked with them and... Uh, and so I fell automatically into that dialect, and then they suddenly talked about Hitler, and it was so nice, you know, Hitler was such a good man, you know, they all misunderstood him. And they talked about the, uh, the, the flak artillery, which defended Frankfurt, and I, I participated in that too, and the airplanes, you know, the, everything was just completely there, you know, as if the last 50 years nothing had changed, you know. But it's just fantastic, yeah, right. Yeah, 45 or whatever. Let's <laughs> yeah. remember the good days. Yeah, right. And the good days, and, and the good days was when, when there was community, you know, this Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, and so on. That is, you know, against that atomism, against that narcissism of society, you know, where there are no real friendships or so. And, and it, uh, I mean, even now with mental health, you know, I always thought when I came back from the airport in the night, you know, it was burning, I thought these people have to be nuts, you know. I mean, it was much better to be in an airplane or in the artillery position than to be in these basements while this carpet bombing took place, you know. And uh, so, but, but, you know, people stayed healthy. And they became sick in May 1945 when they went out of these house communities and these village communities and were all atomized and alone, that's when then the anxieties and the depressions and all that set in which we have so massively. And a lot, oh, did we, did we talk about uh, an enormous amount of deaths from the concentration camps that occurred after liberation? Did we talk about this? No, no, we didn't. I mean, but isn't this a phenomenon that occurred? Uh, people yes. who were doing well, yeah. and then after liberation, an enormous amount of mortality. Yes, and the, the U.S. Army had to teach its sergeants not to feed these people in large quantities because they were just gorging themselves on food because they haven't had any. Yeah. Well, they haven't called for a long time. The Hegel, and so one day they came and said they wanted to have the Hegel back. And, uh, and they said, why do you need the Hegel? Nobody will eat them. So they said, yes, there is one guy who needs the Hegel. I said, give me the name of the guy. <laughs> they had no idea. There was no it was just a, uh, was just a foul excuse. So I took a whole summer and hundreds of books which I had for 30 years and all brought back to them. Oh, and then I took another book out. I took the wrench on them. Yes, you know, that's it. Italian. Right. Yes, you rely on your students to get your books. Yeah, <laughs> right. I buy them. Or oh, like somebody has experience. <laughs> that's the ideal thing that you really own, you know, the books with which you work, really, if possible, you know. Mm -hmm.
to the library. Okay, you wanted to know life. something about what? Georg Lukács. Okay. And his influence in the early Frankfurt. Okay, okay, so what do you know already? Lukács, right? Uh-huh. So, of course, Lukács. he was not Frankfurt's school first person, right? No. But he was in Frankfurt, so he studied in Frankfurt, you know. And so you have Western Marxism and you have Eastern Marxism. And so the question is, what was he, you know? Did he belong to the Western or the Eastern Marxism? The Frankfurt School belongs to East, to Western Marxism. Now, I think what brought about a certain alienation between the Frankfurt School and Lukács was that for some time he cooperated with Stalinism, and for some time he was in opposition to it. And so it's the same thing what they had with people uh, who were in East Germany, you know, under the Pankow government, were close to them, like Brecht, you know. Brecht went back to Switzerland to East Germany and then got a wonderful house by the Pankow government and the Frankfurt School didn't want to talk with them anymore. So they were very sensitive about this. But um, the main book, you know, is of course this Glass Consciousness book, which, uh, which he wrote, Glass and Consciousness. History, history, and, uh, history and, yeah, and that was very influential, I think, on most of the of the writers of the Frankfurt School. But this was really very that. early. Yeah, very this early. Was when he was, when yeah. real Leninism, no right. Stalinism. Yeah. So this yeah. was 1919, yeah. 1922, yeah. 1923. There was cooperation, yeah. He was also Jewish, right? Yeah, I think so. I didn't know that. Yeah. I just he was, yes, yeah, so was, that was another element which found them together. And you know, in my three volumes I emphasized that Jewish Jewishness uh, more than they ever had done before. They were hiding it to some extent. Maybe there was a good reason to hide it, you know. Not only from the Nazis or what you couldn't hide it from the Nazis, but also in New York, you know, they were very careful about it. So he was a party member. Hmm? He was a party member. Yeah, he was a party member, yeah. And he was related to Moscow like like those people in Zagreb, you know, the, many of my friends they were also a part of the of the elite in, in Moscow and travel back and forth and so on and so and, and that I think they were somehow you know a little bit skeptical about this then his literary work you know he wrote beautiful things analysis of, of literature in terms of the marketing, marketing theory of superstructure and base structure and, and, and so on so uh, that got lost in the Frankfurt school you know the superstructure got lost in where, where they are now there are with labor unions and uh, neo-fascism and things like that. But what Lukács did, you know, literature, or what Adorno did, music and literature, and Benjamin literature and religion and so on, um, that fell a little bit. I mean, he was a genius, you know, Lukács, and, and so was Adorno and so on. So they, they had more sense for these cultural things than, than they have it now. It's just not people are not... There's a heavy criticism against Lukács from, you know, Habermas and from uh, Axel Honneth. Yeah, well, the question is about what? Yeah, well, that's the hard thing, thing because you, reading either one of them, you know, you spend hours and hours reading page after pages mm-hmm. where, you know, a few words could have did instead of them just pontificating mm-hmm. or being mm-hmm. over. But, but what do they say against Lukács? I mean, what is the argument? They, they, so it has something to do with the party. That, that theory was subsumed over the party. Theory yeah. served the party right. as opposed yeah. to the party serving theory. Yeah, I mean, they turned it around. Yeah. He did. And then they, they think that uh, that the concept of class has to be re-evaluated. Mm-hmm. And they use the Lukács to criticize and try to move it forward. But I really don't see that they're doing anything other than yeah. verbal obfuscation. Yeah. I mean, that class thing, you know, it has some reason. One, the revival of civil society, you know, and then one doesn't want to talk about this class because it's a real painful uh, core of, you know, civil society issues. So we cover it up here with racism. And in Germany they did also cover it up with racism. You know, they didn't want to talk about it neither. So I think one thing with Obama may be that this racist thing will be removed maybe and the class thing can come into the foreground, you know. It would be nice. Yeah. But uh, another thing is the workers themselves, you know, mm-hmm who do not want to be their own class. That means to have a false consciousness about themselves, uh, a self-deception, you know, which one could attack from a Marxist and a Freudian point of view, you know. So, I mean, the confusion in the mass media, you know, about hard-working middle class, and nobody talks about the lower middle class, and therefore nobody talks about the middle upper class. The rich, the billionaires, appear all as individuals, not as, as a class or such, you know. So, um, the... Uh, 
So I think these are the reasons. And maybe the Frankfurt School themselves are guilty <clears throat> that they have not, uh, you know, by going into culture, um, well, they do talk about bourgeois literature, you know, or bourgeois religion and, and so on, but um, sometimes they don't know even if the bourgeoisie still exists. You know, they are very unclear type of things, you know. Uh, I mean, in, in Hitler's time, you know, when Hitler visited Krupp, for instance, then everybody knew where Krupp was. Krupp, you know, was upper class, you know. Like here, Ford, you know, and and uh, and, and so on. It, it was, there were names to it. But it has all become very anonymous. You know, I don't think that Americans know very well who their ruling class is. But they are angry now. They, yesterday they sent the FBI, you know, to Wall Street. So they picked a few of the gangsters, but they are gangsters, you know. That is the, the issue, you know. And so, but the American people do not have a clear class concept of who rules them, you know or whom Obama is up to. My thing with, with Clintons and Obama was always that the Clintons have this criminal element in themselves, you know. Therefore, they would have been tougher on, on, on these gangsters, you know. Obama is so very nice. I mean, what, what does it mean when he says they are shameless? Or, or, these are pretty understatements, you know. <clears throat> they are not shameless. They are other gangsters, you know. They should be put into prison, but I don't think that he will do this. The whole thing with the pardoning, you know, none of the, of the Bush uh, cabinet can leave the country. And you know this, because every country of the UN is obligated to put him to Den Haag, you know. So uh, after Rumsfeld went to France already, they caught him already. And the Germans pulled him out, you know, in the last moment. So like Pinochet, the same thing would happen to Pinochet, you know, in, in London. That would happen to all of them. They cannot even go to, to Ottawa. When, when Bush was there, the last time the, the, the lawyers organized already, but they had immunity still. So since the 20th of January, they have lost their diplomatic immunity. With Pinochet, they gave it back to him. They, they create some jobs, you know, senator or whatever, in order to, to protect them again. So what will he do? Will he pardon the guys who were involved in torture? According to our own standards of the 1980s, international, it is a war crime, torture. So they have to be caught, these guys. What will he do with them? You know, so all this, um, I'm, I'm frightened for, for Obama, you know. I mean, his, his horizon is a liberal horizon, uh, um, you know, Roosevelt liberalism, and that was the only thing which we could do. It was a good thing, you know. But what next now? You know, this, uh, this, whatever they do now with the one billion or trillion or whatever, it will not rescue capitalism. Uh, you know, the first New Deal did not rescue capitalism. The war did. So this one will not do it. It's the end, you know. And so what What will they do beyond this now? You know? Will it be Perron or will it be Chavez? I have a question about yes. that that, yes. that I've been dying to ask. Right. About the alternative futures, one, two, and three. three yeah. Why are, why are there only three alternatives? Well, if you have a fourth one or fifth one, they can add it to it. But I worked for 45 years and nobody gave me another one. That means one which I could, which one, you know, could not subordinate under the three. It's possible, you know, that there is one. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, alternative future number one would be a technocratic one, which a positivist would do, or a fascist one, you know, a socialistic one. So there would be three versions of the same totally administered society. And I think what we are looking forward to is which one of these three is it now, you know. I mean, if we have corporatism and solve this thing as corporatism, government and the corporations together, then we have fascism, you know. That's one way, you know. The other one is uh, to do a socialistic thing. And, and it's the whole question, something between the free market and, uh, and state capitalism. You know, we would have to develop something between the two so that a small private sector at least would, would be, you know, for, for businessmen like David or for, for restaurants and, and so on and so on, up to 250,000, if you want to go to Obama or McCain, you know, up to a million or two million or whatever, that would be harmless. But everything else above that would be federalized. But the question is, you know, would it be federalized now in a fascist way or would it be federalized in a socialistic way where the 180 million workers would have an input? And pressure, you know, and this whole talk about the revitalization of labor unions and such, Fox News is wild about this, you know. So they will, Obama will make new laws which will make it easier for them to organize. 
the depression in the last eight years. You card, know, card, card, check card, check hmm? card check recognition. Right, yeah, right. So, and, and then if the Democratic Party becomes more and more a Labour Party, and the labor unions together, you know, could maybe lead to a socialistic solution. Uh, but if one should use that word still, you know, for the guys to the such a night, you know, there's an old fashioned word, socialism and so on. Well, you use another word, you know, communitarianism or whatever. But it is not so old fashioned. And Fox News says, you know, why does socialism not frighten people anymore? <laughs> They are really desperate. They all need the couch. They should be put on the couch. They will need it for the next year. Okay, is there anything else on our, uh, George Lukacs there? I mean, his whole literary analysis is, is beautiful, you know. There's tons of I mean, well, let's see. Do you want to look at I, I, I just thought, he, uh, from, from what I've read, and it was sparse in history and class consciousness, but really his concept is very, quite against. Uh, the authoritarian personality right, perspective yeah. that could not exist. If you, you if you have authoritarian personalities, you dispense with class because it's very determinate. Personality is deterministic. He has he uses this quote from uh, what uh, uh, cri critique of um, from, no 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 from Marx uh, uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right yeah, yeah. proletariat is uh, it's not what this or that proletarian thinks. It's what it is. Structurally, so so you don't study class consciousness uh, through surveys, or you don't study it through this. You study it through what, um, what is it called? It, it, imputed, imputed, imputed. You know, if they thought right, this is the consciousness that they would have, that they, yeah. that they would have, or that they if they, they should should have. So he has this idea. His most important concept, reification, mm -hmm. and. Do you want to talk about Ray? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's part yeah. of this project is really looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what he's working on? Well, it's found in all of them, yeah. right? Because you first get it from Marx, right? Where we're, we're mm -hmm. taking something that isn't real and making it an object, and reading through Marcuse, right? Because that's who I picked. I abandoned Hanna for the moment. Is that I need a working definition of reification, and the only thing that I could come up would be the ruler. The measurement of an inch, right, is a reified object. It doesn't actually exist one inch, but we use it as an object to measure other things. Uh, am I understanding the idea of reification, right, or am I missing the point here? Because reification, if I'm understanding it, is that we take intangible objects and treat them as they are real objects. But that also has something to do with like what they do in the sociology department that we've all criticized. That, you know, they take a certain phenomenon, they bracket it out of this historical context and all these other connections and then count it. Yeah. It's been reified. It's been turned into a thing that doesn't exist. Yes. So the yeah. inch, because I'm trying to find simple things, right, because you have to explain this to freshmen. Right, so I need simple examples, and then from there we'll build up to larger, more. Yeah. Just think, you know, thingification. Sometimes that word really exists, really. And the philosophers talk about thingification. So to make a man into a thing, you know. So Fromm, for instance, has you know the discussion yeah, about yeah. this. To what extent a worker is made into a thing? That means like what made into a machine. tool, yeah, yeah, or a machine-like, and then so on. So and and they they fight against this thingification, this functionalization, and, and so on. So the commodification, yeah, exactly. these are all forms of reification. But there is, there is also that's something... Is, um, see, hmm? yeah, that's is, 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 um, yeah. but, I mean, there is also something positive in that. So Marx would not uh, deny it all. So an artist deifies himself. In a certain sense, you know, Picasso made this thing there which hangs up there, you know. So I think, as we said already, the, the resolution of the thingification is how you get back to yourself, you know, how, how this can be, to some extent, reification may be necessary, you know. Uh, any any uh, uh, you know, t guy who is in a, in the, uh, what, a shoemaker or uh, a baker or whatever, they all do reify themselves. Their energ energy goes into their bread, which they do, or into the shoes or whatever. So it's not something poisonous or bad or whatever. But really isn't the, 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 the essential point from fetishism of commodities that once we're, we've objectified yeah. that labor, 
the if the case is right. Of it, yeah. we, 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 once we've objectified that labor, but in the fetishism of commodities in feudalism and capitalism, yeah. the point is the connection between its producer is cut. So yeah, our, right. our essential relationship to the products, yeah. to the commodities yeah. that we create, is destroyed. And so the commodity takes on a life of its own. Right. And so it's right. not, and so it's not why is there unemployment? Yeah. Oh, it's the economy, like yeah. you said, bracketed. Yeah. So you know, it's yeah. capitalists and workers and real human beings. Right. So we've reified uh, causality. Yeah. It's not human beings, it's... Economics. No, it's really it's because, sorry, it's relationships. Yeah, so. it's relationships, <laughs> and they're specifically human relationships. Right. So and that's what reification does. It takes real human cause, real human uh, causality and, and relationships, and creates them into these abstract concepts that right. come to rule yeah. over us. So, uh, and the Lord and I, I give you commands, but not really. I, I fetishize and. I'm doing God's will, and God gives you well, commands. Faith, you know, faith, 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 faith is when when it is told the secretary. You know, faith wanted it that way. That is the reification. Well, so how is it that means something which is okay. our own mm -hmm. appears opposite to our own psyche, takes the life of its own, dominates us, and we are also worshiping it mm -hmm. because yeah. in this fetishism is the beginning of religion. So. When people go through the halls there and see these commodities and so on, they behave like the people in the temples once did. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why Weber thinks, you know, we are polytheistic. The civil society is polytheistic, you know. It's the same thing like, the, like fetishism, you know, because it's idols. Fetish is an idol. So it becomes in their own life, but it dominates us, and we also kneel down before it. We can't it. recognize. We have we a masochistic, yeah. masochistic relationship to us. Okay, know? let's fold in the concept so it's of not, alienation. It's nothing or whatever, you know? Okay, then yeah. fold in the concept of alienation at this point. Well, it's very similar to that, you know? Well, is reification a subcategory of alienation or the vice versa? Well, it's just, I mean, today it has become a very psychological thing. That is why Adorno, for instance, didn't want to use it at all anymore for some time, you know. So. Well, yeah. But uh, which is an economic thing again, you know, and, and uh, man alienates himself from himself when he puts fenders on this, you know, for eight hours, the car, and, uh, and then, you know, the problem is the car doesn't show, that shows this is a big castle, but this car is not a seabed or whatever. So there is this, uh, that is the element of alienation, one becomes a stranger to oneself, a self-estrangement, you know. We do not recognize ourselves or anybody else that I am in these fenders which I put on for eight hours. So let's put them on backwards. Yes. Okay. Then, then they have yeah. your name. Yeah. Then yeah. we recognize that. See, but right. made this mistake, and then I become famous. Exactly. Yeah. As a wrecker. Yeah, and then the alienation is broken. The negative in But in a very negative sense, yeah. Right, very good. But, but in, 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 in all of the definitions of alienation, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think the, the, the alienation or that which is objectified comes to rule us. Mm -hmm. But in, specifically in yeah. reification, we think that that object which we created and, and right. alienated from us, it's ruling us. Yeah, right. So, um, we're not conscious um, of it. You know, yeah, right. so the, another you know, package is I'm a slave to the clock. Right. No, you're not a slave. You're well, a slave to the capital. That, that <laughs> I'm not seeing that, that unconscious part of it is also one of the things that connects Marx with Freud. Yeah, the whole exactly. would say that yeah. something rules over man that man himself is unaware yeah. of. Yeah. 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 So when, when Freud says, you know, sociology is just applied psychology, there is something in that, you know, that he does not recognize that the society has its own laws in the sense that it turns opposite to us. The worker's own work appears opposite to him and fires him. Now, the, the same production in which he's involved, what he has produced, does not only turn against him and separate from him and his own power, his own life, etc., it does all the things to its own creator. I mean, all these ten thousands are losing their job now, you know. And the overproduction theory of Marx, you know, still makes sense in this whole thing. I, I listened to their speech acts today, you know, a lot of them of this confusion could be cleared up with this overproduction, you know, because in a certain sense they have produced too many houses. Yep. They have produced too many cars, you know. So um, now General Motors gives, uh, for separation money or so, gives everybody $25,000 and a car on top of it, you know, because the more they get rid of the inventory, 
And even if they give it away as a, as a present, all these toys, you know. Like the place where milk is put into the streets because it's overproduced. It puts the price right. down and so on. So I, I don't think that all the problems they have could be enlightened by this theory, but a lot of them can be, you know. Where, um, so why, why should... And, and behind that is the question you know, that there's no planning. So when they had already too many cars, they continue to invest in the cars. When they had already too many houses, they continue to invest. Instead of having a plan and say, we stop investment into car and houses now, and we put it into schools or into streets or whatever. And they don't do this. You see. So that is why uh, this housing bubble and whatever they... To some extent, I, I don't say all of it, but to some extent, the, the country, you know, because they come up without the theory, they obviously do not have a theory, they repressed it, you know. So, without the theory, they come up with fragments. But you could get many of these fragments together by this, by this uh, theory, you know, why they have these problems. And so, uh, now, even when they have the relief program now, they want to give money into the hands of the consumers to do what? to empty the inventories, you know. But what if they put it into the banks, for instance, you know. Or what if they take, you know, so many millions and go to Switzerland, you know, and empty their inventories and not ours, and, and so on, you know. These are, so I think in theory and in practice it could help. And that's why the finance minister in Germany said, you know, Marx may have been right with his uh, theory of crisis, with his crisis theory, you know. Therefore, they stream into the libraries in, in Europe, you know, and, and get Marx out again. It would be it would be a good thing, you know. And it's a strange paradox, you know. The most oversexed nation, you know, after the 60s, it's a, thinks that Freud talked too much about sex. This is strange, you know. Or the most over-economized type of society, profit, 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 work, 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 and so on, think Marx talks too much about economics and is an economic determinist. How sick can you get? You know? well, that, that has to do with Bernays, too. I mean, Eddie Bernays, yeah. the, the nephew of Freud, they yeah. use Freud against the anti-Freudian American public. Yeah. You know, he used his own theories of sexuality in marketing and public relations and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. oh, yeah, the dad was a Yeah, uh, he's he's never heard of yeah he uh, orchestrated the, what's it called, smoking campaign with the March on Washington when the women were going for suffrage. Mm -hmm. Right? And he planned it out so that they would all pull out their cigarette cases from their, uh, what do you call those? The strap that holds up their yeah, yeah, guard, all guard, 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 and so they had 20, 30 of these women would pull it out in the middle of the parade and all light up together because one of the tobacco industry came to Bernays and said, "Hey, only 50 percent is smoking. We need the other half." All right? He got in, and it worked. I mean, smoking yeah. skyrocketed after that point because it was seen socially acceptable that these so women who are shakers and movers are going to vote and everything else were smoking. Yeah, so. socially acceptable. It was sexy, and they were called freedom smokes or something. Some freedom some ridiculous freedom like this or something like that. So they put it as suffered smokes, which yeah. would do well. So smoking was identified with freedom of yeah. women and whatnot, right, and they're saying yeah. all the women were smoking. But this was, Eddie Bernays was the nephew of Freud, and he yeah. read it right out of Freud's stuff on how to, you know, do this, how to appeal to the sexuality, that then we now say we talk too much about. Right. But yet all the PR people, all the, you know, they all read Bernays. Yeah, they all know how to do it. I have a, a Time magazine from 1960, and it's all profiles all the communists and every cigarette ad has some somebody in a basically in a bikini mm -hmm. uh, on a beach, you know, Newport. By the way or no one um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see any cowboys. There were all people in yeah. all women in bikinis. But anyway, wait, Wilson, the house, Wilson told me a few weeks ago I should go to the uh, to the Senate and to the uh, union in order to that the law would be enforced against smoking people in the entrance of Moore Hall <laughs> because he has to smell all that stuff and he gets more cancer than he has already. And so I did go, I did uh, go to both, and, but there are a lot of girls, you know, who 
smokes there be in, in the entrance to Moor Hall, but in other places too. Well, bring up so the it's fact still going on, you know. Well, bring up the fact if they isolate the smokers, then they'll have to build buildings for us to smoke near or around, mm -hmm. so we don't get rained on. Well, when I go up to, out of the classroom and they smoke, they it cannot have been so terrible that you have to commit suicide now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it's terrible. So. He, he has to smell the cigarettes when he walks in, but the, all the diet coke cans that stack up from the ceiling to the floor. That yeah, yeah, help yeah. Hi. Okay. So Very good. Anything else? For, for, so we have with uh, George Lucas today. Well, then let's go to the Tower. Right One thing which I um, which I want to tell you is maybe for the next time we can observe a little bit, you know, when you listen to the news somehow accidentally and see to what extent this the crisis theory of Marx, you know, would help to clarify things, you know, and to put different phenomena, you know, uh, together, mm -hmm. because they don't know, should they help the people who have no housing, you know, should they help these people, there's a horrible, horrible thing, now they don't want to help the people with the housing, but they want to do another thing, that means they come up, after 900 billion dollars, they come up with another 500 billion dollars, you know, to have the, I mean, it's a horrible chaos, and I think it is, the chaos comes from not having they have a liberal theory which is exploding, but if they would have another theory, they could get those things together and also could plan better. You know. So, okay. so do you want to do the video? Yeah. Video, or do you want to go to Krakow? No, we want to have a video. Video. Okay. okay. So it's all right here, really. Everything's going down. Yeah. If you look at every indicator. Yeah. See, the, the total, look at, I mean, you can see it from where you're sitting. Yeah. Uh, hopefully the more it goes look down, the better the chance of this item comes. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> the dollar is going down against the, the yen. The, yeah. the no, he already yeah. told us he's from Krypton. Did you see that speech? You know, in terms, terms of supply and demand of the ATM and the, 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 the currencies and so on. The dollar is down against the yen. Crude oil is back down to 40. Um, oh, what's it? McCain, they had McCain and Obama, yeah. and they all had bonds yeah. are down. Yeah. Yeah.